All right, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joe Schwartz from McGill University. Dr. Schwartz is the d director of McGill University's Office of Science and Society. Uh, he is well known for his informative and entertaining public lectures on topics ranging from the chemistry of, the, of love to the science of aging. Dr. Joe has received numerous awards for teaching chemistry and or interpreting science for the public and is the only non-American ever to win the American Chemical Society's prestigious Grady Stack Award for demystifying chemistry. He hosts the Dr. Do Joe Show on Montreal's CJAD and has appeared hundreds of times on the Discovery Channel, CTV, CBC, TV Ontario, and Global Television. He is also an amateur conjurer and often spices up uh, his presentations with a little magic. Dr. Joe also writes a newspaper column entitled The Right Chemistry and has authored a number of books included best, including bestsellers Radar, Hula Hoops, and Playful Pigs, The Genie in a Bottle, or in the Bottle, The Right Chemistry, and An Apple a Day. Dr. Joe was awarded the 2010 Montreal Medal, the Canadian Chemical Institute's premier prize recognizing lifetime contributions to chemistry in Canada, and in 2015 he was named the winner of the Balls Prize for Critical Thinking by the U.S.-based Committee for Skeptical Inquiry in recognition of his 2014 book, quote, Is That a Fact? It's our pleasure to have Dr. Joe Schwartz uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I owe part of the success that I've had to a pig. And uh, therein lies the story. Back in 1980, the city of Montreal had an ongoing fair called Manners World. One of the pavilions there was UNESCO's, the scientific arm of the United Nations. And they asked me and a couple of colleagues to mount a scientific display, which we did. We hired some students and did the usual puffs and bangs and color changes. And we had about 250,000 people every summer go through there, uh, including our future prime minister. That's Justin Trudeau there in the foreground with his father, who was prime minister at the time in, in the back. And uh, uh, I hope he enjoyed our presentations. And uh, we featured uh, an interesting demo in one of those presentations, and that was the making of polyurethane. Polyurethane is an a insulating material, it's a foam, and pretty neat demo. You pour two solutions together and you get this bubbling thing that, that hardens. And uh, we talked about that, and even back then I was always interested in talking about everyday applications of science. And uh, this was at a time when Miss Piggy was at the height of her career. And uh, I talked about the fact that she was actually made of polyurethane. And I know that that might be disappointing to some of you, but that really is what she's made of. And uh, this was at a time when there was another foam material in the news, and that was urea formaldehyde. And that was causing a lot of concern. People were using that as insulation. And uh, if it wasn't properly applied, you had some leakage of formaldehyde, which is, of course, not a good thing. And there were already lawsuits uh, about this business. But of course, what we were demonstrating was polyurethane, not urea formaldehyde. And I pick up my newspaper one Monday morning, and there was a headline that featured chemistry. So of course, I start reading. And it turned out that it was actually about our efforts at the UNESCO Pavilion. And the uh, reporter was saying that we were trying to put a positive spin on a dangerous material. Well, by about 9 o'clock that morning, I had a letter on his desk. Together with a large egg I made out of polyurethane with a string around it that he was to hang around his neck for penance for having laid the scientific egg. And, uh, of course, I explained in the letter that not all foams are the same chemically. And uh, that you can have something that looks identical to another material but can be completely different in its uh, properties. And I gave him an analogy. I said, you can look at a clear glass of liquid and you don't know whether it's water or vodka. Being a reporter, he related to this. <laughs> and then he did something the next day that it's very rare in journalism. He printed a mea culpa article in which he said that the problem really wasn't polyurethane, it wasn't urea formaldehyde. 
The problem was that he had skipped too many chemistry classes in high school and hadn't realized that you could have different materials look the same but have very, very different properties. Well, I thought that that was it. I thought, you know, I had a little triumph here. And the next morning, I get a call from a radio station in Montreal, CJD, asking if I would like to come on the air to comment on this controversy. So I said, of course, but, you know, this is not a controversy. And I told the story very much like I told it to you here. And then the week after, uh, I guess they liked the way I described it. They asked if I wanted to come on and talk about other scientific issues, answer questions. And that was back in 1980. And uh, so started a career on the radio. And it is now the longest running radio show on chemistry in the history of the world. Uh, of course, it is the only chemistry show. <laughs> But it all started back in 1980, which is painfully evident, of course, <laughs> only because you see the dial telephone in the picture. And I don't remember the first question that I was asked, but I do remember the second question, because it was a special one. I thought I heard the caller ask this rather remarkable query. And of course, I, I hear that. I don't know what to make of it. You start to have this strange anatomical juxtaposition going to your head. Well, it turned out that the caller also was kind of nervous, and he had forgotten a key word, which was golf. Because, as I was to learn, golfers sometimes pick up the golf ball and kiss it before putting it back down and, and whacking it for superstitious reasons. It's not a good idea to fill in the dimples with saliva. But he was concerned because he knew that there were chemicals that were sprayed on golf courses. And he was worried that, you know, he'd be transferring some of these chemicals to his lips when he made love to the golf ball. <laughs> so we talked about this. And uh, I explained that, look, uh, you know, the, the cornerstone of toxicology is that only those makes the poison. And the chances are that you probably would not be transferring a significant amount. But I also suggested that there were better things in life to go around kissing than golf balls. I don't know whether or not you know, he took that, that advice. But over the years, I had many interesting you know, queries like that arise. And I thought that you know, time had come to put these together into a book. And uh, a publisher actually approached me to ask if I would want to do that. And I said, sure. you know, I, keen on writing books, I'd like to become rich and all of that. Uh, not knowing anything about the publishing business then, that you can only lose money when you write books. Uh, but in any case, I even had an idea for the title of the book. I wanted to call it The Right Chemistry. Because, you know, chemistry has always had kind of a pejorative description, toxic chemicals, dangerous chemicals, poisonous chemicals. I want to point out that chemistry was not good or bad. It was all a question of how you use it. And if you use it the right way, you can do wonderful things. And at first, the, the publisher liked that idea. And then I got a call one day from him. He says, you know, we've been sitting around the table talking with our salespeople, and they really like your book. It's going to sell well, but you can't call it the right chemistry. I say, why not? He says, you put the word chemistry on the title, it's the kiss of death. So I said, well, what do you want to call it? Well, I had a chapter in the book called Radar Hula Hoops and Pig Balls. And this, <laughs> this was actually about polyethylene. Polyethylene, a plastic that during the Second World War was used as insulation around radar cables, without which the war would not have been uh, carried out the same way. After the war, it was used in hula hoops. And then I came up on a story where farmers, pig farmers, were actually using pig balls, not the kind of you're thinking of, this kind. Pigs, as you well know, bother each other when they're raised in close proximity and they nibble on each other's ears and tails. And one farmer had the bright idea of entertaining the pigs with balls. And he put these balls into the pig pens. The pigs happily played with the balls and left each other alone. Pig balls. Well, this is what they wanted to call the book. And I said, I'm OK with radar. I'm OK with hula hoops. But I'm not going to be known as Mr. Pigball. <laughs> so, so I suggested maybe radar hula hoops and playful pigs. And so it became. We went with that title. It did pretty well. It became a bestseller, outselling Suzanne Summers. Not that that is a great achievement. Uh, and, and this. This led to numerous other books uh, translated into many languages uh, with, I hope, some intriguing titles. 
And then I hoped that finally I had laid the groundwork so that the publisher would allow me to write my, what became the 16th book, and call it The Right Chemistry. Well, he said, okay, let's give this a try, and we did. So it be, did become The Right Chemistry, and I thought this would be great, you know, I, I thought I could talk about people having the right chemistry, uh, you know, and, and I wish I could say that that book outsold all of the others, but such is not the case. I think the word chemistry still is somewhat off-putting, even though I had really interesting stories in there about the romantic entanglement of, uh, of pigs, uh, the pheromones that are used with, of course, you're very familiar with uh, the uh, androstenol, androstenol mixture that, that you can use in order to put uh, the animals into the mood. And I also told the story of how this is really interesting because these same chemicals are found in our armpit. We know this because there's a lot of research being done in the armpits of the nation. Um, <laughs> This is mostly, of course, to develop new antiperspirants, etc. But isn't this curious that we have the same chemicals that are exuded by, uh, by the boar that are present in human underarm sweat? Well, in pigs, it's without a doubt uh, a sexually active compound. Uh, and it's unlikely that we have evolved to have special relations with these animals. So the question is, are these really human pheromones as well? Well, there's an industry that has seized upon this idea and are promoting human pheromones, and they are sold, as you can see, and they even highlight androstenone, and they sell it both for men and, and women. There is no scientific evidence that this, this works. This basically is a lot of hogwash, is what it is. And this is the kind of stuff that we really deal with through my office at McGill in Montreal. We try to shine light into the dark crevices of the world of pseudoscience. And uh, our, the university actually said that our job is not over the moment that our students graduate and leave the university. Because today there's such hunger out there for scientific information that if it isn't fulfilled in a proper, unbiased scientific way, people end up listening to whoever standing on top of the tallest soapbox yelling the loudest. And those tend to be the quacks. And they are getting better and bigger and bigger. And it's getting to be harder and harder to deal with them and to overturn their cockamamie ideas. When we first started this enterprise, I thought we needed a logo. And I suggested this one to the university. <laughs> it's not that we're against eating animals. What we're against is this commodity which is being piled higher and deeper, harder and harder to dig, dig out from underneath it. You can go to your local health food store and find some aerobic oxygen. I don't know where you would go to find anaerobic oxygen, but... <laughs> and they will tell you that we are becoming deficient in oxygen because of all the pollutants we spewing into the air, there's less oxygen, which of course is total nonsense and we therefore have to supplement. So this has a smidgen of potassium chlorate, which in theory can release a bit of oxygen, less than what you would get in one breath. It's absolute nonsense, and of course we do not breathe through our guts. So people will tell you though that they take this, put a few drops into a glass of water, and they feel better. Well, that's of course the placebo effect. What is also interesting is that on the next shelf, you'll have antioxidants, and they don't see the irony of this. They don't see that on one hand they're telling you the wonders of, of uh, oxygen and the other on how oxygen leads to free radicals which are going to uh, stop the or enhance the aging process. Today, with the scientific illiterate audience that we have out there, you can sell almost anything, including dehydrated water. <laughs> and there's also the image, unfortunate image, that, that the public has developed of us chemists, that we are evil people locked away in a laboratory just thinking about what new cancer-causing additive to unleash on the unsuspecting public. Why? So that we can kill off our customers. <laughs> well, unfortunately, these days, you can cherry-pick data to prove almost anything you want to prove. In science, of course, we should never do that, cherry-pick data. We should 
look at all the information. But the media, of course, does cherry pick, and you can show almost anything you want. If you want to show that bacon is killing you, you can indeed show that. If you want to reference a study that shows that bacon is the ideal breakfast, you can also find uh, one to do that. And it goes back and forth like this. I get questions about stuff like that. Is it true that eating bacon can make you sterile? Now, usually there is some smidgen of fact at the bottom of the barrel, you know, that then gets extrapolated out outrageously. And this was stimulated by study at Harvard, where they actually interviewed men in a fertility clinic and came to this, uh, you know, uh, this conclusion. And this led to a slew of headlines, which I'm sure are going to strike terror into your hearts. Bacon every day might keep baby away. Bonking boffins say bacon bitter. <laughs> Won't breed that bite, won't be. That's a pretty good one. Uh, bat sperm dropped the bacon, and is bacon a male contraceptive? But, 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 but. You also have to control for other factors, and the fact is that couch potatoes have lower sperm counts. Studies suggest saturated fat is, is, is linked, and climate is linked, and walnuts, etc. Well, what is the connection? that the people who you know, hyped up that Harvard study made about why bacon had some sort of an effect on, on uh, male <laughs> activities. Believe it or not, they linked it to pesticides. Said that it is the pesticides that get transferred to the food and this is what causes that, that problem. Now, of course, as soon as you introduce the notion of pesticides, uh, you will raise some red flags. And let me tell you a little interesting anecdote to introduce this idea, an absolute true story. A foursome of ladies were playing golf on a, a golf co uh, course just outside of Montreal early in the morning, and a spray truck comes by, and they feel the spray. They rush back into the clubhouse, and they confront the greenskeeper. One of them says, she got a headache. Another one got a rash. The third one had the biggest problem of all. Well, I'm sure you already guessed the bottom line to the story. There was a spray truck out there early in the morning. It was, of course, spraying water. But these ladies were so frightened of pesticides, having read you know, all of the, the uh, scary literature in, in the media, that they were convinced that uh, these were harmful substances. Now, the symptoms may have been very real, but of course, it all stemmed from the mind. What we're talking about here is the nocebo effect, which is kind of the bad cousin of the placebo effect. There's a strong connection between the body and the mind. If you think the right thoughts, well, you, you can actually improve symptoms. I mean, we know this very well. You give people sugar pills and they can get better. Of course, the disease does not disappear, but, but they have a different perspective of the, of the condition. The nocebo effect is the opposite. If you think that something can do you harm, you can actually develop symptoms, which is what happened to those ladies. Now, of course, the fact is that pesticides are harmful, potentially. They are designed to be harmful. I mean, this is, there's no, no question about this. You want to stay away from exposure to pesticides because they are designed to kill. They're designed to kill insects, fungi, weeds, etc. And the fact is that those insects go for our food and we do have to protect it. But we do have to protect it in a proper way, which is not always done. If you take a look around the world, the way that pesticides are sometimes used, uh, it can be scary because they don't have the protective equipment, they don't know how to take care of them. You, s you see pesticides disposed of completely irresponsibly. And irresponsible use of pesticides can, of course, lead to problems. Here in North America, we have farmers who are well-educated in the use of pesticides. They use protective equipment. They take courses. And, well, you, of course, know all of this. And therefore, the risk is minimized. However, when you show a picture like this, as I sometimes do to, you know, in public lectures, uh, as an example of the way that you know, farming is, responsible farming is done, they say, oh my god, you know, look at the guy. He's wearing a hazmat suit. So surely this must be very dangerous. Well, it turns out that this farmer is actually spraying uh, organic cauliflower field 
with a natural soap spray, which you don't want to inhale because it will destroy the mucus in the lungs. So you do want to take proper care. There is a risk with using pesticides. I mean, we all know that. Uh, but we have agencies that govern the way these things are used. In Canada, we have the Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency. And they're the ones who register pesticides and require a tremendous amount of data before they allow a pesticide to be registered. This used to be submissions on, on paper. Today, it's all done electronically. But luckily, I still do have a picture of the amount of, of paperwork that has to be submitted for one pesticide. And there it is. That's for one single pesticide. It takes years of research by government authorities to look through all of that and eventually either refuse or allow a pesticide to be used with certain conditions. So it's a very, very uh, stringent framework of, of regulation. Of course, it does not mean that we can control for everything. Subtle chronic effects are very difficult to, to detect. We can readily detect uh, acute effects. Chronic effects are different. And you know, there certainly are possibilities of small amounts of pesticides over a long time leading to all kinds of problems. And you've all seen headlines uh, like that. Uh, we know that there are certain diseases that are more prevalent in areas where a lot of agrochemicals are used. Parkinson's is one of, one of these. But the connection is not restricted to so-called synthetic pesticides. Uh, rotenone, for example, which can be used in organic agriculture, has also been linked to Parkinson's disease because it isn't a question of whether or not something is synthetic or natural that determines its properties. Properties are determined by molecular structure. Uh, whether a chemical was made by a chemist in a lab or by Mother Nature in a bush is irrelevant. What matters is what it is, how much we have studied it, what we know about its molecular structure. But these days, the term organic sells. People want uh, organic even though they don't really understand uh, what it is. Uh, they think that it is better, that it is somehow safer. But organic agriculture... Uh, does have its particular niche, without a doubt. And uh, it's never going to feed the 9 billion people who will soon be dining, but it does have a niche market. But it's also important, uh, I think, for the public to understand what organic really is, because they have the impression that there are no pesticides that are used in organic agriculture. And this, of course, as you know, is not the case. There are a large number of pesticides that are allowed in organic agriculture, including things like copper sulfate. When a pesticide is registered, it doesn't matter if it's intended to be used in organic agriculture or conventional. The regulatory agencies don't care about that. They just look at the pesticide and determine is it safe to use or not. The organic industry, of course, wants to use only pesticides that come from a natural source or, you know, quote, organic, copper sulfate can be mined. So therefore, it occurs in nature, it can be used as a pesticide. It's no better and no worse than synthetic pesticides. The one that's really curious is Bacillus thuringiensis, where organic farmers can spray their fields with the bacterium because this bacterium does produce a, a protein that is toxic to insects. Luckily, it's harmless to, to, to humans. They can spray the whole field with the bacterium, including the 30,000 odd genes that that bacterium contains. But should you take that gene out of that bacterium and insert it through genetic engineering techniques into the crop so that the crop can protect itself, this is not allowed in organic agriculture. I mean, this is really a curious business. If anyone should be clamoring for GM technology, it should be the organic farmers. But this, of course, is not what is happening. Now, it is true that conventional agriculture does use more pesticides. But it's not the number of pesticides that are used that determines potential risk or benefit. It's how they are used and the doses to which we are exposed. The Environmental Working Group in Washington, which is an alarmist organization, comes out with statements like this. Apples can have up to 36 pesticides. That makes headlines. Now, that's a true statement because there are 36 pesticides that are registered for use on apples. 
No apple grower would ever use 36 pesticides. You use a couple determining you know, what insects are present, climactic conditions, etc. But they list these pesticides, and of course they have foreboding names, uh, multisyllabic names, and that of course scares a lot of people. You have this creature, the food babe. Let me just ask you, how many of you are familiar with the food babe? Oh, yeah, well, that, that in itself is scary that so many are, of you are, are familiar with her. Uh, Vanny Harry, who has labeled herself the food babe, is an activist. She's totally scientifically illiterate. She has no idea what she's talking about. But she has amassed a legion of followers. And she's the Pied Piper leading people down the wrong path. And uh, to her, if you can't pronounce it, you should not be using it. That's her, her motto, which of course is totally ridiculous. Well, anyway, although it is true that that many pesticides can be used, they are not all used in an apple, but that's the implication here. But furthermore, the fact is that the presence of a chemical does not equate to the presence of risk. It depends on which chemical, how it is used and amounts. These days, thanks to our sophisticated mass spectrometers, and gas chromatographs, we can detect substances down to the part per trillion level. I always tell my analytical, colleague, analytical chemistry colleagues, they're the root of our problems. Because you know, at the part per trillion level, you'll find everything is contaminated by everything else. You know what a part per trillion is? It's one second in 32,000 years, or if you want a better analogy, the width of a credit card in the distance between the Earth and the Moon. That's one per part per trillion. That can be detected. That's not detecting a needle in a haystack. That's detecting a needle in a world full of haystacks. So if you knew that there was one needle in one haystack somewhere in the world, would that prevent you from a good old-fashioned roll in the hay? Probably not, because you, <laughs> you would deem that the benefits outweigh the risks. <laughs> But every year, the Environmental Working Group comes out with the list of their dirty dozen fruits that we should eat only in their organic versions, because if you don't, then death lurks in the, in the aisle. But luckily, there are good scientists who do the research and look at the numbers and come to the conclusion that these numbers are way below the, the, the chemicals that are present, the numbers, the concentration are way below what are thought to be dangerous. So we should be encouraging people to eat apples. And furthermore, there's another interesting note, uh, and that is that pesticides can also have a positive quality because you increase your yield and therefore you make fruit more available. And nobody contests the fact that the more fruits and vegetables we eat, the lower the uh, incidence of cancer. I'll tell you what I think is a real problem, is, the, is the, this battle between conventional and organic. This needs to be stopped because there are multiple ways to approach problems. And in some cases, organic works, in others it, it doesn't. What we look for, of course, in the integrated pest management. Now, it's possible, you know, in some places to grow grapes organically with a lot of labor. You know, it, it's possible. But it depends on, on geography, it depends on climatic conditions, it, it depends on the kind of, 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 of seed, etc. So you can't make a universal you know, generalization. It is possible in some cases to have success with uh, organic agriculture. Now where there is really a lot of concern these days, of course, is with genetic modification. And you're familiar with the, the kind of pictures that we see you know, on, on the web and um, how, of course, uh, Monsanto has become the devil incarnate. And uh, the quacks are constantly uh, talking about uh, Monsanto and the evil things that it's done. Uh, I mean, I, I don't even really understand why they constantly pick only on Monsanto. Uh, I mean, you know, t today there are numerous companies that are involved in genetic engineering, and even glyphosate or, or Roundup you know, is off uh, patent, and there are many, many companies that produce it but Monsanto has become the, the lightning uh, rod. And some of the, the um, uh, proposals on, on you know, how to attack these companies are really outrageous, like this one here. Take action to help stop Agent Orange corn. Well, let me give you just a touch of background on, on, on this story. 
Agent Orange, of course, was used in Vietnam. It was sprayed from airplanes uh, to defoliate trees to prevent the Viet Cong from hiding under the trees. And Agent Orange was a combination of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Both of these are, are herbicides. And it turned out that one of them, 2,4-5-T, when it was produced, had a side product. And that was tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, which is one of the most toxic substances ever produced. However, it was not known at that time. Of course, it wouldn't have been a big worry anyway. I mean, if this, this was chemical warfare, you're not going to worry about you know, inducing some disease in the enemy. Uh, after the war, of course, it uh, turned out that there was a problem because some U.S. servicemen were also exposed in Operation Ranch Hand. And there was big controversy. And the production of 245T was stopped in the 1960s. It has not been produced since. The other component of Agent Orange was 2,4-D, which is still a widely used herbicide. Its production method cannot possibly yield the dioxin side product. Now, I'm not going to go into the chemistry of, of that for you. Just believe me that it cannot be done. You cannot get tetrachlorodibenzodioxin out of 2,4-D. But this, of course, is the argument that they're using that today, with the introduction of crops that are resistant to 2,4-D through genetic engineering, you're exposing people to Agent Orange. This is what people like Vandana Shiva, uh, who goes around the world giving lectures on, on uh, anti-GMO you know, principles. Uh, she fosters this nonsensical idea. She also says that GMO stands for God move over. She believes that fertilizers should not be used because they were developed as weapons of war. <laughs> Another curious angle. You know where that comes from? In the early 20th century, Fritz Haber came up with what is perhaps the most important chemical reaction ever, which was uh, the combination of nitrogen with, with hydrogen to produce ammonia, so that you could make uh, ammonium nitrate, so that you could use fertilizer. This resulted in the Green Revolution, saved millions of people from starvation. Now, of course, it is also true that ammonium nitrate can be used as an explosive, as we know from the Oklahoma City bombing. But that uh, ammonium nitrate does not decide if it is going to fertilize a field or blow up a building. It's people who make those kind of decisions. To, to suggest that fertilizer should not be used because it is somehow linked to chemical warfare is, is outrageous nonsense. Not quite as nonsensical as the graphs that she shows about the growth of autism and the increased use of, of glyphosate. Now, this is one of the weapons that the activists use, is to come up with associations and imply that there is a cause and effect relationship. Associations cannot prove cause and effect. There are all kinds of associations. Yes, there may be an association between glyphosate and increased autism, because both of those have increased in parallel. It doesn't mean one causes the other. There is also an increase in autism linked to organic food sales. And <laughs> nobody would suggest it's causative. Correlation is not the same as causation. There's a very strong link between breast cancer and wearing skirts. Nobody would suggest that skirts cause the disease. So one has to be very careful here. Now, glyphosate, of course, is the chemical that is in the spotlight now, Roundup. Uh, and virtually every day there's some sort of article in the media vilifying this, this chemical. You've also seen stories about how this is less toxic than aspirin, caffeine, and salt, which is true on the acute level, but that, of course, is, is really meaningless. Nobody thinks that you're going to you know, eat some corn that might have a trace of glyphosate and drop dead. That's not the issue. The question is about chronic low-dose exposure. What might happen if you're exposed to trace amounts over decades? This is a very difficult thing to answer. But the International Agency for Research on Cancer thinks that they have an answer, and they put glyphosate into their group 2A category, which is probable human carcinogen. Now, when that gets into the media, of course, everyone gets scared. But here is an important point. And if there's one point that you can take away from here, because I, I, I fully understand that here I'm singing to the choir, but I know that the choir also goes out and sings to others. So if there's one point that you're going to take away, it should be this one, that this scary analysis is a hazard analysis, not a risk analysis. 
That is a big, big difference. I'll explain that in a moment. The IR classification puts substances into four different categories. And glyphosate is in group 2A, probably carcinogenic. There's only one chemical ever that was put into group 4, that's caprolactam, as not carcinogenic. But risk and hazard are not the same. Risk is a function of hazard. I can give you an analogy. Grizzly bear, I think we would all understand is a hazard. Most powerful animal, one swipe of his claw can take up a human head. If you see it in a zoo, the hazard is the same, but the risk is not, because you're protected by the cage. If you meet this animal in the wild, you better start running fast, at least faster than one of your friends. But <laughs> because there, the risk is great. The hazard in both cases is the same. Similarly, when you look at sunshine, it is a real hazard, but you can protect yourself. So the risk is much less. So the IARC is a hazard analysis. It puts hot beverages into the same category as glyphosate because hot beverages can in fact trigger uh, esophageal cancer. It's a very rare condition, but it can happen. Also in group 2A is eating meat because there are associations between eating meat and certain cancers. Also in the same group are baked goods because of the acrylamide that forms when these are, are, are heated. And also hairdressing as a profession is in that same category. That's the probable human carcinogen. Now to put fear into your hearts, bacon is in group one of IARC as a known carcinogen. They crank out these statistics about how much bacon you, know, you can get away with in order to have a, a lower risk. But again, this is a hazard analysis. It is not the same as risk, but it really does frighten people, especially when it comes to glyphosate, which is portrayed as the ultimate killing machine, especially by a lady who's gotten a tremendous amount of press because she's a professor at MIT. Of course, she's a professor in computer technology. She knows nothing about agronomics, nothing about biology or, or, or chemistry, as you can tell from her, her writing. And she believes that glyphosate is responsible for virtually every disease that you've ever heard of. She publishes in these pay-for-play journals, uh, the open access journals, and uh, with a colleague, uh, Anthony Samsell, who labels himself, as you can see, independent scientist and consultant, which basically means unemployed. But... <laughs> And they crank out all of the scary stuff. And, you know, he, he portrays himself as, you know, a big name scientist because he pictures himself in front of a periodic table. But you can't trust people just because they picture themselves in front of a periodic uh, table. <laughs> what we trust is the data. So what is our exposure to glyphosate? We can actually determine this because it shows up in the urine and we can measure it relatively easily. We know what the acceptable daily intake is. It's about half a milligram per kilogram of body weight, and that translates to about four milligrams per liter of urine. If you're taking in the maximum amount, the ADI means that if you take that in every day for the rest of your life, there's no problem. All right, how does that compare to what we find? One to three micrograms. That is one thirteen hundredth of the ADI. I don't think that's much to worry about. But if you look on the web, again, this is the kind of pictures that you see. And it has consequences. Because look at this ad, where they're advertising tomatoes as being GMO-free. All tomatoes are GMO-free. There are no GM tomatoes being produced. So it's a true statement. But it is brought about because of the fear that, that people have. Are there problems with GM? Of course there are. As early as 2006, we already saw resistance to glyphosate. That was predicted. Anytime you interfere with biology, you're going to get some resistant, resistance. The New York Times had a feature article saying that the GM technology has not lived up to its, its promise and listed you know, all kinds of issues. The fact is that when you put all of the data together, what you find is that the technology helps farmers. They get better yield. Uh, you have less insect infestation. Now, it is true 
that, that it works better in some places than in others. It works better with, with uh, some types of problems than, than with others. But especially in Europe, uh, people are terrified of this, uh, this technology with foreboding pictures uh, uh, like this. And uh, uh, this, this was the one that really caused a lot of, of commotion. A uh, quote study by a French researcher that was accompanied by these terrifying pictures implying that the rats that were fed GM corn developed tumors and the control rats did not. Well, other scientists had done this experiment over and over again, never found these results, but Seralini in France did. And he um, came out with a book that were all guinea pigs, came out with a movie about the terrifying effects of glyphosate. He kind of uh, promotes himself as the protector of, uh, of the population uh, against this unholy alliance between big agro, big food, and, and big pharma. Well, it turned out that no one was able to reproduce these studies, and nature retracted the paper. Of course, Serolini did not take that well, because if a paper is retracted, well, what are you really saying? You're, what you're saying is that you're, also, you're either fraudulent or incompetent. Uh, but no one was able to reproduce this. The European Food Safety Association uh, came out with uh, the statement that it cannot be uh, reproduced. Regulatory agencies around the world, from New Zealand to Canada to Germany, come up with the same kind of ideas, that, that the fear-mongering is just not legitimate. The uh, latest one, which just came out this March by the European Chemicals uh, Agency, uh, which is a big, big organization with, as you can see, you know, that's what their headquarters looks like. And they came up with the, the, uh, uh, the idea that Glyphosate is safe to use if it is used according to uh, instructions. But this will never satisfy people. Uh, you know, they, uh, of course, fear anything that they don't understand, and genetic modification is not easy to, uh, to understand. So, uh, you know, you have the continuing articles uh, saying that, you know, Monsanto is, is, is lying and, and they have hidden studies. And uh, there are some studies where Huge doses in animals have caused some problems, but huge doses of water can cause some problems in, in animals. But look at some of the consequences. Uh, because of the fear of GM, grape nuts uh, no longer has any GM ingredients. What does that really mean? That they neither have vitamin A, D, B12, or riboflavin that they used to have before. How come? That's an interesting connection. Uh, it is because those nutrients are made by genetically engineered bacteria. Now, those bacteria, of course, are not in the final food. But because GM has somehow been involved in the process, they cannot use it. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep an eye on the technology. Of course we should. Uh, the future, the only thing you can predict about the future is that it's unpredictable. It may be possible that in the future some problem will arise. I mean, after all, who could have predicted back in the 1930s when Freon replaced ammonia and sulfur dioxide in refrigerators, saving numerous lives, who could have predicted that this chemical, which was inert in refrigerators and inert as, you know, in terms of, of lung function, that in 50 years it would make its way into the atmosphere and destroy the ozone layer? Who could have ever even thought of that? Uh, so it's possible that something may crop up. I think it's unlikely, but possible. Of course, people clamor for the right to know. They want to know if their food contains GM ingredients. Well, this is a, is a very difficult issue to address because if you look at this label, for example, uh, that soybean oil may have come from GM soybean, but that oil is indistinguishable from any other oil. There's no chemical test that can tell you whether it came from GM soy or not because there's no vestige of the genetic modification in the final purified oil. So why would you label that as containing a GM ingredient? Because that would imply that it is somehow different from a conventional oil, which it's not. So it would actually be a misleading label. So it's, it is really a conundrum, but of course, people who want to avoid GM can, because you can just buy organic. 
And by law, they cannot use any genetic modified component. Well, finally, I think that the real message that we have to get across to the public, that life is full of risks. No matter what you do, there are risks. You can be out for a casual walk, and unfortunately, terrible things can happen. <laughs> oh, don't worry, we're nice people, we faked it, they're fine. But, <laughs> but they're not the innocent little creatures you think they are. <laughs> There's a risk to everything, and you have to weigh it against the benefits. The fact is that chemicals are not to be feared, they're not to be worshipped, they are to be understood. Because you can create a scare about anything. I could create a scare about apples by telling you, did you know that this is what apples are made of? Those are not additives, they're not pesticide residues, that's what it's made of. Including acetone, last time you saw that was on the label of a nail polish remover, right above where it says do not drink, acetone is toxic, also contains formaldehyde. You know what that is? That's the stuff that is used in, in embalming by embalmers. Formaldehyde is a carcinogen, highly toxic. It's in your apple. So I could say, did you know that when you're eating an apple, you're getting acetone? That can kill you. But it's an economical way to go because you'll be pre-embalmed. <laughs> well, that could rub you the wrong way, but there's some rubbing alcohol in the apple too. Of course, that apple is not lurking around waiting to take a bite out of us. Although what I said is true. What's the problem? I didn't mention amounts. 500 years ago, Paracelsus, the great sage, laid the cornerstone of toxicology by saying that only the dose makes the poison. Formaldehyde is there in the apple, acetone is there. In fact, those chemicals are there in higher concentrations than pesticide residues. But we don't worry about them because the amount is too little. But finally, I, I think we have the luxury of talking about this, about whether we should worry about bits of glyphosate that may come into our life. When a third of the world goes to bed hungry every night, and since we started chatting here today, there are about a thousand people who are no longer alive. This is our responsibility to make sure that this problem somehow gets solved because the population is going to be increasing. There's no doubt about that. And pretty soon, as we know, there will be 9 to 10 billion people coming to dinner. It is up to farmers, of course, to, to do something about this. And as you heard earlier, the number of farmers have decreased, the population has increased, whereas before 70% of the population used to be involved in farming, now it's only about 2% feeding the whole world. This is thanks to good science and, of course, uh, good agronomics. But to leave you on a, on a positive note, uh, there are some good things coming your way in terms of, of the smell of bacon. Uh, you will soon be able to sleep on, on pillows that will uh, give you the scent of, of bacon, and you can use dryer sheets that will... Uh, <laughs> now, I, I, I suspect that you know, this, this kind of stuff uh, does raise a lot of questions, but one thing we always have to be clear about in the world of science, if we do not have all of the answers, and there are questions to which we will never have the answer, so we have to be realistic about that. But I, <laughs> you know, this often doesn't satisfy people because the truth is, they don't want hard science, they don't want good data, they want magic. They want to be told that you take this supplement and everything is going to be okay. Or you take that pill, it will cure everything. Life doesn't work like that. Uh, if you want to see magic, it has to be on a stage. And I've been involved in this a uh, long time. Uh, when I was back in grade six, I was invited to a birthday party with uh, about a dozen friends. And his parents had hired a magician to entertain us. And that had a big impact on my life because he showed us a trick. Uh, most of the other tricks I've long forgotten, but this one was a good one. He took a flexible rope and he said, you know, I never go anywhere without my magic chemical. He reached in his pocket for his magic chemical. He sprinkled on the rope and he said, that magic chemical 
can make that rope defy gravity. And indeed it did. And I thought that was pretty neat. I didn't know how that happened. I knew it wasn't done with any invisible magic chemical. And I knew that that is what would happen if I tried it. Uh, but he had his magic chemical and defied gravity. Only ropes I can do that with, so don't get to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so believe it or not, I, <laughs> I went to the school library and I took out a book on chemistry and I took out a book on magic because I wondered why he used this expression magic chemical. Why not alakazam, abracadabra, or hocus pocus, which are you know, the usual uh, words. And I followed both of those ever since. And you might think that this is bizarre to follow chemistry and magic. I mean, chemistry is a hard science firmly rooted in the laws of nature. Uh, what is magic? What do magicians do? Magicians do the impossible. They take ropes, make knots in them, and then magically untie them against the laws of nature. So I got interested in, in that because I knew that there was also some real science behind the magic. And as, as a magician, you don't want to reveal it, but as a scientist, of course, what you do is, is relish in giving people the explanation. But I will leave you with one last idea. And I think that this is an important one. Uh, as I said, in science, we don't have all of the answers. And we also have to be careful about saying that something is impossible without really investigating it. I have this little puzzle here, because life really is a puzzle. And the question is, how many geometric shapes I can make out of this? Uh, it has straight edges and hinges. Well, of course, I can make a triangle. In fact, I can make two triangles. I can make, obviously, a square, parallelogram. I can make a pentagon. Question is, can we make a circle? Well, the sort of reasonable answer is no. How can you make a circle? You've got straight edges and hinges. But the fact is that sometimes in science, we have to think outside of the box. We have to think in a different dimension and realize that you can take a square and make a circle out of it. So uh, science has all kinds of potential. Uh, we just have to realize it. But we also have to realize that we mustn't dismiss something just because it doesn't seem to make sense with what we know at a given time. So thanks very much for uh, your attention. If you are interested in further in some of the stuff that, that we do, uh, there's our uh, website. I also have a personal Facebook page. And the reason for that is that there are some comments that need to be made that I cannot do on an official university website. I, <laughs> I cannot use the appropriate language that the food babe deserves on the Migo website, but I, I can do it on my uh, Facebook. So you might want to take a, a look at that. Uh, so thanks very much for your uh, attention and uh, look forward to a good taste of bacon. Thank you.